Hey, you have come to the right place for encouragement today. So go ahead and click the subscribe button so that you can be connected to all the videos that we upload all throughout the week. Now, you may feel led to get connected to the ministry as you're watching this video, and we've made that super simple for you. Go ahead and check out our description to find out the ways that you can connect with us. Now, while you're watching, you may also feel led to sow into the ministry, and we encourage that because we know that our ministry can reach those that are far, near, and in our backyard. We have outreaches all throughout the year, and you will help us tremendously by sowing into our ministry. Thanks for watching. Now check out this message. How many of you ever had a moment in life where you know that you were just really just, just tripping? You know, my, my daughter who, you know, I pretty much have raised and uh, was taken in by my family around 12, 12 years old or so, uh, she's infamous for that. When I'm having a bad day, she'll say, Dad, you're tripping. Because family will call you out, you know, Others may talk about you, others may step back, but family will, will flat out tell you, you're tripping, you're tripping. And when you're tripping, it's, it's really you're at a place where because you're at a place where you're, you're saying things and, and doing things off of assumptions and they're not even all the way always accurate or, or real but it's just a perception that maybe you have of a moment of of a person of an attack and it's it's really not accurate because if it was accurate you're not tripping you're actually doing uh, what you're supposed to do, you're, you're, you're validated in doing what you're supposed to do if you're accurate. You're tripping because you're acting in a way that, that is kind of stupid. And, and when you start tripping, like I said, it is often perspective. You're not hearing something right. You're not seeing something right. And if you're not hearing things right and you're not seeing things right, then you're not going to think about things right. And you're going to find yourself tripping. And the sad thing about tripping is you're getting all flustered about something that's not even real. You're getting paranoid about something that's not even true. So I, I put a couple things together just to help somebody to identify whether or not you're in a season where, where you're tripping. The first thing that you will find happen when you're tripping, and these aren't in any order, any one of them could come first or last, but when you're tripping, you, you will tend to have negative experiences. And you don't know why every experience is so negative. And there's commonality in it. It's not just home. It's your job. It's not just your job. It's your church. Our lives are broken into really three categories. There is our, our, our home, our job, and our church. Those are our three big pillars. Home, my job, my church. My spiritual side, my family, and how I make my money. When all three are off, it's because you're tripping. If all three are off, you can't blame one or the other. You're tripping. If it's just one, it just may be a season where maybe home is off. But church and your job are, are doing well. And, or if it's your job, but home and church are good, that's cool. Or if it's, church is you know, kind of frustrating me right now, but home... And my career are really good. When all three are off or two of three are off, it's usually because if we can be honest, we're tripping. And everybody or every experience is not wrong. There's one thing that's in common in all three scenarios, and that is me. So when you're tripping, you have negative experiences. When you're tripping, you often find yourself in negative environments, prisons in a way. And you're getting frustrated because you see others doing well, but your environment is negative because you have made the bed and now you've got to lay in it. It leads to negative environments. 
leads to negative expectations. You are always down. There, there is never up moments with you. There, there, there is never something that gets you going that has that spark in your eye, that, that has you talking like it's going to be a good day. There, there's, there's negative expectations. You go home and don't expect anything good to happen. You go to your work and don't expect anything good to happen. You came to church today and didn't expect nothing good to happen. That's because you're tripping. David said, man, it pleased me when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. I never go to the house of the Lord without expectation. If I go into God's house and do not expect something to happen, I am tripping. Yeah. How can I be in a place with so much faith and not have expectation? Unless it leads to negative emotions. You're all over the place. You're always crying. You're always sad. You're always angry. You're always snappy. These are negative emotions. And Jesus said, I want you to have my joy. And I wanted you to have it more abundantly. How is it Jesus wants me to have joy, but I'm always depressed. My life looks the opposite of what he died for. He's not tripping. I must be tripping. So who's having negative experiences? Who's having or going home or working in negative environments? Who has negative expectations? And who has negative emotions? All of these go down to perspective. And, and this is why Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, he, he said, you know, when the devil starts fighting you, understand the fights that you're going through right now, you know, are, are not fleshly. They are not natural, but they are spiritual. And you do have the power in you to demolish strongholds. He goes on to say that when these thoughts come into your head that do not line up with God's will and word for your life, you have to take these thoughts captive. You can't let them run wild because if you let them run wild, they're going to destroy you. If you let them run wild, what started as a thought is going to become your way of thinking. And what happens is you will find yourself in a place where you're tripping. This is why the scripture says things like, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Because there's going to come moments where you don't feel like moving forward, but you can't let how you feel those emotions get you to start tripping. Be instant, the Bible says, in season, out of season. When I feel like it, I have to preach, the Bible says. When I don't feel like it, I have to preach. I don't have the right to put myself in a place where I allow myself to start tripping. Because one season of tripping can kill a testimony or a witness that you have been building for years. Look at somebody and say, are you tripping? The Bible is full of people that have been in seasons or went through seasons where they, they were tripping. Moses had a season where he was tripping. Moses tripped a lot. I just chose one of them, but Moses did a lot of stuff that was tripping. But there was one point where Moses said, Lord, why have you put so much on me in Numbers 11? You can read it when you get home, 14 to 15. Why have you put so much on me? Go ahead and kill me. If I found favor in your eyes, kill me. Moses was tripping. He went through so much with God 
over 80 years to get to the place where he says, Lord, if you love me, kill me. Moses was tripping. Elijah was tripping. He got done beating all these false prophets in, and one crazy woman had him not wanting to live no more. How can you let one crazy woman put you in a place where you don't even want to live any longer? I know some brothers are saying, well, you haven't met the woman, you know. Let me just tell you, a woman does have a lot of power. But he was tripping. He did all of this. And Jezebel was her name. And all she did was threaten. She said, this time tomorrow, Elijah won't be alive. And it was just a threat. She never even followed it through. But a threat put him in a place where he started tripping. Be careful when threats like, we're going to cut your electric off, a threat. We're going to take your home, a threat. You're going to lose your job, a threat. You're going to die of this sickness, a threat. Watch out when threats cause you to start tripping. It's in those moments that you have to look at God's track record and say, you know, I, I just kicked hundreds of prophets, false prophets' tails. The odds were hundreds to one, and I overcame that. Why would God let this thing be the thing that takes me out? I am tripping. If God was with me before, he'll be with me now. If God got me through that, God will get me through this. I am tripping. If God got me a man before, he'll get me another one. If God got me a woman before, he'll get me another one. I am tripping. If God got me one job, he'll get me another job. I am tripping. If God helped me beat the flu and helped me beat COVID, what is cancer to God? I must be tripping. God is powerful. God is mighty. God can do whatever God wants to do. God can promote whoever God wants to promote. How am I allowing a threat to put me in a cave? I must be tripping. Look at somebody say, stop tripping. Stop tripping. Elijah was tripping. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, was tripping. He was in a jail cell and he says to the Lord, you deceived me. I was deceived. You overpowered me and prevailed. I'm ridiculed all day long and they mocked me. And he goes on to say something so crazy. I will never mention your word or speak your name again. What? And we know the story. I'm going to talk about him in a couple weeks. So I don't want to preach it. But he would go on to say, and right when I wanted to quit, your word is like a fire shut up in my bones. There's too much word in me to quit. But in his emotional state, in his prison, he says, Lord, I ain't talking about you no more. I'm done talking this faith stuff. I'm done telling people about your goodness. I'm done inviting people to church. I'm done sharing the street. I'm just done. He was tripping. And even Paul had a moment where he was tripping. It says the Sadducees and the Pharisees were trying to rip him into pieces. They were so divided and they were trying to pull him apart. And it says the following night the Lord stood near and said, Paul, take courage. As you testified of me in Jerusalem, you'll go to Rome too. Paul was at a place where he wanted to quit. God doesn't waste his words. If he's telling Paul to cheer up, take courage, it's because Paul is afraid and he thinks that maybe God has left him in this bad situation. And God says, Paul, we still got a journey to take together. Stop tripping. And today... We're going to talk about John the Baptist. And when I read how he was tripping, it kind of tripped me out. Because I would expect everybody but John the Baptist to trip. 
I mean, this dude was born for Jesus. <laughs> Jesus wasn't born for him. He was born for Jesus. See, 2,000 years later, we can say Jesus was born for us. Jesus was not born for John. John was born for Jesus. When Mary got pregnant in the book of Luke, it says that the angel came down and said, Hey, Mary, your old cousin Elizabeth, she's pregnant too. She's having a child. And Mary was questioning this because she's like, well, Elizabeth's old. I'm young, but Elizabeth's old. <laughs> this was so shocking to Elizabeth's husband that he doubted God and God shut him up and didn't let him talk. Be careful when you put your mouth on what God's doing. Amen. God will shut your mouth when you talk against what he's trying to do. But God said, Elizabeth, she's pregnant. She's having a baby. Because with me, with me, all things are possible. Then NIV says, for no word from God will ever fail. John was born for Jesus. And a little bit later in Luke 1, you know, verse 41, it says that sometime later they would finally meet. And a lot of people believe that Elizabeth and Zechariah thought John was dead because she hadn't felt the kick. And some say he may have even been dead. But when Mary walked in the room, John jumped. See, have you ever had somebody that their presence in your life makes something in you jump? I tell our team, I tell our staff, I had a meeting the other day telling everyone around me, I said, you know, no, no matter what we're going through, no matter what we're facing, we must always remember that when people stand in front of us, there has to be something inside of them that jumps. Because when God is in you, the Holy Spirit is in you. When God is in you, it's the same as Jesus in Mary. We just have the Holy Spirit in us. Everywhere God places you, people with dead things should feel resurrection. Everywhere that God places you, people should feel things starting to come alive. If God puts you somewhere and people aren't experiencing a jump, then there's something about you that is tripping. So the babies are in the same room together in fluids. And John, he can't think this experience because you cannot bring your head to a God experience. You could bring your head into serving, but you cannot think God because he's too big. And John is a baby. And look at how the baby is having an experience while the baby's brain is not still developed. I learned a long time ago, you cannot help somebody think their way into the faith. I used to sit down and talk to people for hours and they were set on their ways. I've learned that if my presence and my testimony and my spirit can't change you in a short amount of time, then no long amount of time is going to help. Because either you feel God or you don't feel God. There is nothing I am going to say that is going to help you to comprehend God. Because if I can be honest, I've been doing this for 20 years and I still can't comprehend God. Right when I think I got him, I learned something new about him. Right when I think I saw all there is in a story, here he comes showing me a whole new area, a whole new way to look at the story because I can't comprehend him. He has to be experienced. And John is having an experience. Don't tell me young kids can't get saved. Because when John had an experience, it says that in his mother's womb, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He's the only person to come out of a womb filled with God's Spirit. And we wouldn't see him anymore for about 30 years. He's been busy. Thousands start following him. 
years later. And we see him in Matthew chapter 3. He's down at the water and he's preaching. And John's sermons would probably bore most of us because he only had one sermon. Repent. Repent. That was his sermon. Repent. Repent. He was baptizing people. And if you went to John's church, you say, what's Pastor John preaching today? Repent. I heard he's doing a new series. What's it called? Repent. Everything with John was repent because here's the thing. You cannot have a revival if you do not repent. Yeah, you don't make God get on board with your lifestyle. You have to repent from your lifestyle if you want to experience God. So he came down just preaching this message on repent. The kingdom of heaven is near. And, and it says this was spoken through the prophet Isaiah saying uh, a voice of one calling in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight. His path. John. Was walking in his calling. And thousands and thousands are coming to hear John preach. And to get baptized by John in the Jordan River. When I went to Jordan some years ago, I got a chance to walk uh, this trail they call John's Trail. And it's the, the trail, they have a little spring they call John's Spring where John would have gotten water. And John's house has been uh, memorialized in Jordan. And the cool thing is he's coming in the spirit of Elijah. His actual house was built where Elijah ascended. Right on the other side of Jordan was where John lived, waiting on Jesus. And he has not seen Jesus in years. I don't know how long, but he, he, he has not seen him. We know he has not seen him because when he would step into the water, John says, there's one coming who I know not. I don't know what he looks like, but I do know this. I'm baptizing with water. He's coming soon to baptize with fire. And I, I'm not even worthy to tie his Jordans. That's what I think he would say today. He says, I'm not even worthy to tie or untie his, the straps of his, his sandals. And as John is preaching, Jesus is coming. As John is getting started, Jesus is on the way. I figured out in life that if you want to get Jesus to come, get started. Because if you get started, he's going to come and validate what you've been doing. John is in the Jordan and he is baptizing and the crowds are all around him. And it, and it says in, in, in John 1 that as he's baptizing, uh, he, he, he saw Jesus coming towards him. And he says, look, the Lamb of God. Look, the Lamb of God, he, he, he's recognizing Jesus as Jesus is stepping into the water. He says, I myself did not know him. He doesn't even know what he looks like, but he's having a, 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 a moment. He's having a, a deja vu experience. He says, behold, the Lamb of God. Jesus ain't the Lamb yet. As far as people see him, the Lamb is going to get slaughtered. How are you seeing the cross, John, when nobody at this in this crowd knows who I am? How do you see my future? While everybody is bumping past me to get to you. See, God will send people into your life that see where you're going. 
He will send people into your life that talk to you on the level that he's taking you to. Everybody in your future is not going to talk to your past and talk to your mistakes. God says, I've got some people that I've been prepping before you that are going to speak to your destiny, that are going to speak to your future. While, while they see a nobody, I see the lamb that is going to change the world. God says, when I see you, I see a world changer. When I see you, I see an influencer. When I see you, I see somebody that heaven wants to use. John says, I have classified information. Behold the Lamb of God. How do you know he's the Lamb of God if you didn't know who he was? And I can't claim this or take credit for this. I heard this said years ago. But the reason that John knew that this was Jesus is because he's been here before. The last time they met, they were in fluids together. And now here they are again in the Jordan in fluids together. Except this time around, there is no flesh in between. See, God says the reason you're here today is because we were kicking it a long time ago. But you know it's your season to be used because in this season, there, there's no flesh in between us. Let, let me modernize it. In this season, there's no man between us. In this season, there's no woman between us. In this season, there's no addiction between us. In this season, there's no distraction between us. And God says, I had to let some years go by because I was getting rid of all the things that stood between us. But now it's just me and you. And now we can talk about your purpose and your calling and what I have in store for you. John and Jesus are back in the water all over again. And John would take Jesus down into the water and pull him up. And John's whole life would change after this moment. He would go from a superstar in a lot of ways to a person that never really gets talked about no more. It, it was getting so bad that John's disciples were saying peace to John and going over to Jesus' ministry. Andrew and John, the disciples, started with John's church. And it is true that some plant and some water, but God gets the increase. See, the reason Andrew and John had to leave John the Baptist is because they finally found somebody that could take them where they needed to go now. Yes. See, my old ministry was good to get me in. Yeah. But the problem is they didn't have what it took to get me to the next level. Yes. God has a way of sending people into your life that have what it takes to help you get to the next level and unlock everything he's placed inside of you. This is why Orpha had to follow Naomi. This is why Elisha had to leave his parents, his earthly father, and say hello to his spiritual father. It's because God will send people into your life that have the keys to your next level, the keys to the doors that you need to get open open. So this is why you got to get out of bed every day because it's not about whether or not you see an opportunity coming. God has a way of allowing an opportunity to walk past you. And they say goodbye to John, the Baptist church. And they start chasing Jesus. But John was cool with it. He knew his purpose. And that's the thing with knowing who you are. People's words can't get to you. Sadly, so many people never get to the place where they make their own opinion about anything. So when somebody else gives you an opinion, their opinion becomes your truth. John was good 
And when the Pharisees came to him, they said, John, your boys, your people, they're going over to Jesus' ministry. What are you going to do about it? He said, man, is the bridegroom ever upset that his friend's getting married? He said, this must happen. This had to happen. I must, John 3, 33, I must decrease. He must increase. You know you're getting real about your faith when you finally get to the place where you say, God, I must decrease. You must increase. I got to decrease in my home so that you can increase in my home. I've got to decrease in my marriage so that you can increase in my marriage. I've got to decrease with my finances so that you can increase my finances. I've got to decrease, God, so that you can increase. And for two years, we would never hear a whisper from John until we get to our text today. It's been two years, and John is in prison. Some say it's self-afflicted. If he would have kept his mouth shut, he wouldn't have been there. See, King Herod had this thing. He, he liked this, this woman named Herodias, and Herodias did it for him. But the problem was Herodias was his brother Philip's wife. And John said, I'm going to marry my brother's wife. And John the Baptist speaks up and says, that ain't cool. God don't like that. That's an abomination. But Herod, you know, Herodias, the woman, she was like angry with, you know. But Herod was like, nah, man, I like John's ministry. I like John's preaching. And, and he said, I ain't going to kill him. I greatly enjoy him. The Bible says he greatly enjoyed John. But one day, Herodias manipulated him. See, this is why you got to be careful who you connect with. Because when you connect with the wrong person, they can cause you to kill something you really love. Yeah. Herod love John, but because he hooked up with a woman who didn't have the same love for his preacher, yeah. he ended up having to kill the preacher because one day Herodias, this is how foul this one was, she sent her daughter in to dance for John, or Herod. And John, Herod loved the dancing so much, he said, I'll give you whatever you want, girl. She said, Mom, what should I tell him we want? The head of John the Baptist. But John has got himself in prison. Right over the Jordan River in the land of Jordan, he is locked up in, in Herod's prison. And he's hearing about Jesus. But here's the thing. Everything he's hearing is not good. See, he came and he decreased so that Jesus could increase because he wanted this thing he talked about with baptism of fire. You know, that was his thing. I did it with water. He's going to do it with fire. He wanted baptism with fire, and he expected Jesus to take up his ministry of repent sermons every week. But different things are going out about Jesus. Remember, Jesus said John didn't party or drink, and you said he has a demon. Jesus said, the son of man come partying and drinking, and you got a problem with him and call him a drunkard and a wine-bibber. Yeah, Jesus was that dude. He had a reputation. He said, John now was a saint. Didn't do none of that stuff. But me, oh, I drink, Jesus said. He says it in the word. I, I drink, and y'all call me a wine-bibber and a partier. And this stuff is getting back to John. And it's frustrating, John. Because this is not what John signed up for. This is not why John decided go, the going to prison was okay. 
This is not why John handed over all his work. It's to see Jesus changing everything up. And it says after these things, after Jesus sent his disciples out, John sent two of his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one or should we search for another? See, after these things, after Jesus sent his disciples out, what, what has Jesus been teaching his disciples? It says he sent out 70 and he has been preparing them for persecution. He's been preparing them for just how hard following me can get. Because you have to understand, it's not always going to be easy. He tells them things like, I'm sending you out as lambs among wolves. He tells them things like, families will be turned upside down because I did not come to bring peace. But I came with a sword. Wives will turn on husbands. Husbands will turn on wives. Children will rise up against their parents. He says, I'm letting you know that when you do this, it's not always going to be easy. And he says that when you go, I don't want you to take nothing with you. Why do you tell me to take nothing with me for the journey? Because I want you to see that it's not just all about persecution. I want you to see that when you say yes to the call, you can go out with nothing and I'll make sure you have everything you need to do what I've called you to do. It was Paul that said, and my God shall supply all my needs. See, when you say yes to the call, God says, I don't need you to have the degree. I don't need you to have the hookups. I don't need you to have the money and the savings. I don't need you to have the right marriage. I don't need your kids to all be in order. Just go with nothing and give me a chance to show you that I can give you whatever you need, that I can touch people's hearts to be a blessing to you. He says, I don't want you to take nothing because yes, the harvest, he said, is plentiful, but the laborers are few. He says, the fact that you're making my harvest happen, I am going to make your provision work. Amen. He's preparing them. He's getting them ready. And he's telling them about how hard it's going to be. And they're winding up. They're just getting started. They just went to engage. They just signed up to be VFDs. They are on fire. <laughs> but then we see a guy named John who, while they are firing up, he's been doing this for 30 years plus, and he's firing down. You got to always remember when you come in excited, there's usually somebody that you're coming in to help that is tired from the work they've been doing. They're excited. They will come back and tell Jesus all the stories and they will be so joyful that God used them. And John's just sitting around like, what is going on? Are you the one, he says. Or should I search for another? Are you the one or should we search for another? This is John. This isn't some rookie. We don't have to question whether or not he's filled with the Holy Spirit. This is John. And in his prison, He's having a bad moment. He's questioning Jesus. I told you he's been hearing all of these rumors about Jesus. He's going to parties? What? He's drinking? What? He's a friend of sinners? What? What is he doing? 
But Jesus would go on to say, but wisdom is proved right by her deeds. And I love that. That's a bad statement because what Jesus is saying is, don't judge what I'm doing now. When it's all said and done, wisdom will justify what you don't understand in this moment. But still, John's in prison and he's getting bitter because he's hearing all of this stuff. And he's ready to literally lose his head. But before he loses his head, we see him losing his mind. Are you the one or should I search for another? You know, when I read this, it allows me to give grace to people that start to question things that God may have put in their life. Like if John can question if Jesus is the one or should he search for another, shouldn't people get grace if that's how they feel about their marriage? Shouldn't people get grace if that's how they feel about their church? Shouldn't people get grace if that's how they feel about their children? Are you the one or should I search for another? There will come moments where you question things that are of God. Are you the one or should I search for another? This is where the be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding, instant, in season, out of season comes in. Because we see a group going out excited and we see this old vet questioning the ministry he joined. Are you the one or should I search for another? And Jesus doesn't defend himself. I learned this years ago. Jesus doesn't defend himself. Tell John it's not what he thinks. Tell John I'm, I'm really still a good guy. Tell, tell, tell John I'm, I'm still studying every morning. T tell John I'm still fasting and praying. Jesus doesn't defend himself. Whenever you see a person defending themselves, it's usually because they're guilty. Jesus doesn't defend himself. You know what he says? Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead raised. And the good news Claimed, not to the rich, but to the poor. He says, if John is doubting what I'm doing, tell, this is what Jesus would say if he was alive today, tell John to go to YouTube and watch a You Care video. Because here's the thing, when a person's heart's right with God, that kind of stuff is all that matters. I, I, don't, I don't need you to defend yourself. I just need to see, is outreach still happening? Are our programs still being started? Are, are we still going after the poor? What Jesus is telling John is, tell John the game has not changed. Tell John we are still doing what we have always been doing. It may be a different method, but it is the same ministry. Tell John that the gospel is still moving forward. Tell John, actually, we're just getting started. Tell John that nothing has changed. Change. And that's the word for somebody that's in a prison right now and feels like you're tripping. God is saying nothing has changed. The mission for your life is still the same. The mission for your ministry is still the same. They are still feeding the poor. They are still helping the least, the lost, and the left out. Tell John to stop tripping because you see what's happening. That's why we do videos here at Uproar, because I don't want to stand up here week in and week out and tell you what we're doing. 
I want you to see what your church is doing. Tell John what you hear and see. And blessed is anyone that does not stumble on account of me. Tell John, blessed is anyone that does not stumble on account of me. Why? Jesus is saying, because this stuff has nothing to do with me. This is the mission that me and John partnered to do when we were babies in the womb. And nothing has changed. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. The Greek word for stumble here means trip. Tell John, blessed are the people that don't start tripping. See, this is why God needs you to stop tripping, John. Because you're tripping is costing you a blessing. Your tripping is costing you relationships. Your tripping is costing you opportunities. And God is saying that as we're right around the halftime show of this new year, can God get you to stop tripping? Can God get you to walk in your purpose, to walk in your calling? Can God get you to grab the blessings that he has for your life? Can God get you to stop tripping? He's tired of you having negative experiences. He's tired of you having negative environments. He's tired of you having negative expectations. He's tired of you having negative emotions. And he's tired of you having negative exchanges. God is saying, I want in this season for the tripping to stop. The devil has been in your head, John, for too long and nothing has changed. Look at somebody and say, stop tripping. Blessed is everyone that's not tripping. And these disciples, they said, okay, we're convinced. See, Jesus had to convince them because a lot of times people like John can't be convinced if the ones relaying the message are not convinced. Like a first time guest coming to our church can't be convinced if the ones sitting in church right now relaying the message aren't convinced. So God is saying, if I can get you to stop tripping, I can get everybody I'm going to have you spread this message to to stop tripping. But if the ones relaying the message are not believers, then how they present it to the person that needs the word is not going to make them become a believer. So tell John, tell John, tell John what you hear and see. Tell John what you hear and see. Well, I don't know about, the, tell your John what you hear and see. Well, I have my, my concerns. Tell John what you hear and see. And as they go back, as they do what Jesus told them to do, you know I'm going to say it. Look at somebody and say, get your ass in order. <laughs> as John's disciples were leaving, look at what Jesus does. Jesus begins to talk to the crowd about John. They're gone. They're not going to tell John, man, Jesus was bragging on you, dude. Jesus was telling everybody about you. They, they don't know this. John will never know this. But as they go, Jesus begins to talk behind John's back. He talks to the crowd about John. What did you go to the wilderness to see? 
a reed swayed by the wind? What would you go to his ministry to see? Somebody that didn't have a backbone to stand? If not, would you go to see a man dressed in $5,000 suits? <laughs> a man dressed in fine clothes? No. Those that wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Jesus says, what'd you go to see? A prophet? Oh, I'll tell you, yeah, you, did. you went to see more than a prophet. This is whom the scripture's written. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare the way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, there has not been anyone greater than John the Baptist. Look at how Jesus is even putting John before him. What I love here is, even while John is doubting, because they haven't even told John yet. They just started walking back to where John was. They haven't told John. But even in John's doubting state, Jesus is bragging on him. To every person that feels like you're in a place where you've let God down, you hurt God's feelings. God says, don't ever think that you're so bad that I'm not bragging about you behind your back. Amen. I may not be talking to crowds about you, but you better believe I am talking to angels about you. Amen. And this would be all that John would need to get to the finish line. He just needed to be reminded. And today's message is a reminder to every person that is tripping. That God is not entertaining your tripping. But he's trying to get you to open up your eyes to hear and to see all that he's put in front of you. Tell John what you hear and see. And when Jesus would get done, he would do the craziest thing. I think he was thinking about his friend. He began to go to the towns where he had been. And it says, denounce them. <laughs> because what? They did not repent. Why did Jesus go from having this conversation about John to now going to all the towns that did not repent and denounce them? It's because he's thinking about his friend. And he doesn't stop there. I think he's actually talking to his friend when we get a little further down in 20, verse 28. He says, he actually yells it, come to me. All you are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. I think when Jesus went through these cities, he was trying to reach every person like John that was tripping. And today's message is I think a message from God to every person that reminds him of his friend John that was tripping. And he's trying to pull you out of this thing that you've been tripping over. But you have to make the decision as weary as you are and as burdened as you are to say, I'm going to come to Jesus. Look at somebody and say, stop tripping. In closing, when he was relating the generation to John, he said this, this generation is like children playing in a marketplace. I used to wonder what did that mean? They're dancing and piping in the marketplace. And what he's saying is this generation 
is like children playing in the marketplace. This generation is like children in a place of business bringing games. Children don't realize that money's being exchanged all around them. And what he's saying is, to every person tripping, you're playing in the midst of an opportunity that could be changing your life. And if you could ever stop tripping, you could see the magnitude of the moment that God has put you in. But you'll never see it if you keep tripping. And to the young disciples that were coming back, what they got a chance to see from Jesus is that one day we may start tripping but what we're witnessing with Jesus is a God that when we start tripping, he will always be a yell away from us. And the lesson of today is that God, no matter how much you're tripping, is a yell away from you. And he will come to you. He will give you comfort. And he will change the course of your future if you can stop tripping.